All right, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this evening at Food and Water Watch for our webinar, Factory Farms, The Case for a Ban. My name is Michelle Merkel and I'm the co-director of Food and Water Justice, which is the legal arm of Food and Water Watch. I'll be your host this evening and I'll also be a participant. Joining me are two other speakers. To my left here in DC is Patty Lavera. Patty is the assistant director of Food and Water Watch. She also directs our Food and Water Policy Program. Before joining Food and Water Watch, Patty uh, consulted with grassroots organizations on toxics and environmental justice issues. He she then joined Public Citizen to focus on food related issues and left Public Citizen, I'm sorry, I said Public Justice, Public Citizen. <laughs> 13 years ago with Winona Howder, our executive director to start Food and Water Watch. Um, she is encyclopedic on all things food, food monopolies, food safety, <laughs> factory farms. She's gonna talk to us tonight about the current problems with our food system. Uh, she's gonna make the case for a ban and talk to us a little bit about how we can achieve our bold vision. Also joining us is Chrissy Kasterman from IO where she is working this evening normally. Um, Hails from North Carolina. Chrissy is our factory farm campaigner. She helps to build our advocacy efforts at the federal level. Um, she also responds to our factory farm, uh, like state related uh, legislation and works with our allies to um, achieve our campaign goals. And prior to joining Food and Water Watch, Chrissy worked for 15 years in rural communities on a variety of issues. She, um, Hales currently from Eastern North Carolina. We, as you might remember, had to postpone this webinar because her house was flooded for eight days because of Hurricane Florence, including um, likely some waste from a nearby factory farm. Uh, Chrissy is gonna tell us a little bit about her current situation and also talk just a little bit more about the state organizing campaigns that she's leading to support the factory farm ban work. So before we get started, I just wanna thank everyone tonight for being here with us. This is um, a specially designed webinar series for our most loyal supporters. That's all of you. We really appreciate your contributions to Food and Water Watch. Without them, we couldn't get our work done. And we also would really like your input this evening. So there will be a Q&A session after the presentations. In order to ask a question, you, you can look at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. If you click on that button, it will allow you to type in a question. And you can do that at any time throughout the webinar and we'll make sure to try to get to as many of them as we can. So before we um, start with our formal presentation, I just wanted to take a minute to explain what a factory farm is, if you've never heard that term. And I grew up in a pretty rural part of Pennsylvania, but I had no idea what a factory farm was at the time because we didn't really start to see these large scale industrial livestock operations until the 90s. At that point, I was um, recently graduated from law school. I was at the EPA as an enforcement lawyer, and I became involved in a case with farmers from um, Missouri who were fighting mega hog operations that were polluting their communities, both their air and their water. Um, what I learned from that case is that all over the country, really small family farms were rapidly being replaced by these large industrialized complexes that uh, housed our um, animals and buildings with little access to light, no access to out of doors. I'm going to uh, share a picture of what one of these hog operations looks like from the inside. And so the legal term for these operations is concentrated animal feeding operation or CAFOs. They're often also referred to as factory farms. And as you can see from these pictures, the animals um, are confined and they stand on top of metal grates. The waste falls through those grates to a pit below the buildings and then it's flushed out by a water system. And all of that waste is put into these large cesspools. So in, the build, in this picture in the uh, foreground, you see these large buildings where thousands of animals are crammed into them. The waste gets dumped into what looks like lakes in this picture. They're actually giant cesspools um, that can be three or four acres big and 20 feet deep. They then take that waste and spread it on fields, ostensibly as fertilizer, but we have too, many, too much manure being produced in our country and too little land to apply the waste to. So a lot of times it like runs off into um, waterways, it leaches from these big cesspools into groundwater. And so we had filed a case against two of the largest um, hog operations at the time, Premium Standard Farms and Continental Grain. They had 21 of these huge complexes that you're looking at in just five counties. They had over a thousand buildings that were housed over 2.5 million hogs. They had 163 of these massive waste pits. 
and they produce as much waste as a city of 10 million people. That's New York and Philadelphia combined. And so all of this waste really wreaked havoc on the community. The pits overflowed, causing massive fish kills, the toxic gases from the decomposing manure made people sick. And then also, here's a picture of these rat-tailed maggots that kind of blanket the lagoons, and they produce lots of flies that really make it impossible for people to spend any time outside, open their windows. And so EPA was supposed to fix this, right? We came in, we had the first ever claims under our clean air laws, in addition to Clean Water Act claims. But in the middle of the litigation, right after the Bush administration came into office, I walked into work and was told that I had to settle the case or drop it all together. I was also ordered to drop all other investigations of factory farms that I had going on at that time. And so I was um, angry, I was shocked, but in that it was an important moment for me because I learned that Justice isn't a given, even when you're dealing with an agency like EPA, whose mandate it is to protect public health and the environment. It's something that we constantly really have to fight for. And so I settled the case. I also quit EPA over the case. And now I sue them from Food and Water Watch because, you know, people in Missouri are still suffering and citizens are still trying to obtain, obtain justice. But what I've come to realize and what we, we have, you know, determined over the years at Food and Water Watch is these operations are not fixable. We have to reform the fundamental structure of our food system, including getting rid of factory farms. We have to stop making rural areas sacrifice zones. And calling for a ban might seem really audacious, but if we have learned anything from our fight on fracking, um, we go big or go home, right? And within a few years, we've been able to obtain fracking bans in Vermont, in Maryland, in New York. And so we know that when we come together collectively, we can meet our audacious, audacious goals and, and we think we can do it with factory farms as well. And so with that, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Patty, who's gonna talk about how, to, how we got here in the first place and what we can do about it. Sure, so I'm gonna put... You want me to share this? Yeah, I'm gonna show a couple pictures just to kind of uh, do this as fast as I can. Um, it's a, it is kind of a long story about how we ended up with factory farms, but it's, it, we can condense it and we can condense it a little bit with some pictures. So this first picture that hopefully everybody's seeing is, um, the way that we like to think about the food system, like the shape of the food system. And it's a little surprising to people usually, but we use this image of an hourglass where we had farmers at the top consumers at the bottom to make the point that there's stuff that has to happen in between, right? I don't go buy a live chicken. Uh, if that's what I want to eat for dinner and I'll go buy a bushel of wheat, like stuff happens in between, right? That crop gets sold and processed and taken to a store and it matters who's doing those steps in between. And we use this image of the hourglass because over the last several decades, and this is not a coincidence at the same time that we've seen the rise of factory farms, we've seen a real shrink in the middle of that hourglass. We've seen it get skinnier because fewer players run those steps. So we think that's kind of like the visual to keep in mind when we think about how we got here. Uh, if you're talking to economists or business people, they talk about the consolidation of our food industry. But what that boils down to in this picture of this hourglass is control. And it's control over the dollars in the food system, who gets to keep them, whether the farmers get any of our food dollars, right? And it's also control over how and where food is raised. Um, and it's, we think, a big driver of why we have factory farms. So um there we go uh, and the next picture we'll show you is just we can do this for lots of different foods this image came from a book that winona howder wrote called foodopoly that kind of does all of these you know does all of this explaining this is just one way to think about what that control looks like so if we do use the example of pigs um to 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 make this particular point there's four companies that process over 70 percent of all the hogs in the united states so that doesn't mean if you're a pig farmer that you you have four choices where you live you might have one you might have two and that puts you into an economic position where you're not calling the shots smithfield and tyson and jbs and hormel are the ones calling the shots um, and that has changed where and how we raise animals. So this uh, picture of this map is from a website that Food and Water Watch has done called factoryfarmmap.org. Uh, everybody always asks, why is the data from 2012? It's because this is very hard data to get. Stunningly, the government is not super thrilled to track where factory farms are happening because they know folks like us would publicize that. So we've had to do a bunch of other things with a census that comes out every five years. So 2012 is what we have right now. But the point of this map is to show that that consolidation of control by certain 
key players have given us factory farms and it's also concentrated where we're raising animals. So for this particular example of hogs, we've clustered that production in a couple of places. That makes, we're gonna talk in a minute about the environmental impact that makes. And we're also, it also changes, uh, it changes the dynamics of who is raising animals and how. And so this is the only nerdy number slide I promise that I will show you. We could, we could do this all day. We have a whole case study about what it means when you change animal production like this. But this one I think is important. If we look at a place like Iowa, Iowa has always raised some animals for food. They've always raised a lot of hogs in particular. It made sense to raise them there. But if you started looking in the 1980s, we started to see those companies who is processing the hogs, who's buying them from the farmers. We saw that that control of a couple players getting bigger and bigger and bigger. They got more and more of the market under the control of just a couple companies. That started in the 80s and it's now, you know, actually closer to 80%. And at that same time, if you looked at who's raising hogs in Iowa, as we've seen that control increase over 25 years, the yellow bar of how many farms in Iowa raised some hogs. We went from almost 50,000 farms in Iowa raising some hogs down to less than 10,000 in 20 years. During that time period, Iowa raised twice as many hogs. So it wasn't that everybody just got out of the hog business in Iowa and we weren't doing it there anymore. We didn't run out of pork products. They're actually producing more, but we're doing it on fewer farms. And that red line, the farms that were raising hogs, that red line got bigger. The average hog farm is 10 times bigger than it was at the beginning of this trend. So if you've ever read about food policy or heard somebody give a talk about food policy and they say get big or get out, that's what this looks like. A lot of farms got out and the ones that stayed or the ones that replaced them are much, much, much bigger. And that matters for a bunch of reasons. It's not just, oh, that's how economies change. It's more efficient. It's how economies grow up. These are different systems. They're different operations. And there's a lot of impacts that come from that difference. This map of Iowa is just one um, example of that impact. Michelle already referenced it. So if this is a, a map of Iowa, they're the biggest hog producer in the country. So these are the counties in Iowa. They're red because they're, they're you know, all producing, compared to the rest of the counties in the United States, they're producing lots and lots of factory farm raised pigs. And one of the very visible impacts that happens when you concentrate this production in a place is you concentrate the waste from those animals. And so if you look at just one county, if you looked at Franklin County in Iowa, in 2007, they raised 10.3 million hogs. Those hogs have manure and that manure has to go somewhere. It goes onto farm fields where it is used as fertilizer, but it is applied at rates that are way beyond anything that, that corn or soybeans you're growing there might need because it's about waste disposal. And if you calculate that into something we're more used to thinking about in terms of, you know, this was sewage from a city, it would go to a sewage treatment plant. If we calculate that and figure it out, that one county in Iowa produced the same amount of sewage as three times the city of Seattle with no sewage treatment. And that's one county. So this is what we're talking about. This is not, this is what it looks like to raise animals. We've always done it this way. This is different. It's a different system. So the list of impacts go on and on and on. So I think that's, that's my last slide. If you want to turn that off. So there's lots and lots and lots of other impacts um, from climate this is a big, this industry is driving climate change with its contributions when you count the feed that animals eat, the way we handle this manure and its tendency to produce methane, other air emissions that neighbors have to deal with, what happens to waterways when that manure runs off, the public health impacts of using antibiotics in these systems because we they use antibiotics as a crutch to keep the animals alive in these very stressful systems, what workers go through, what communities work go through, what these animals go through in these facilities. The list goes on and on and on. And so what we've been grappling with and what lots of groups have been grappling with with years is how do you take on this system? There's so many tentacles. Um, and one thing that's been missing in that analysis is that we have this system because of policy. We have the system because of our farm policy, because we've failed to regulate how big these companies have gotten and how much power they have, and we've failed to hold them accountable on the environmental consequences of this model. And we have these bad policy choices because of the political and economic power of these companies, and that's what we have to take on to change this system. So after a lot of history of trying different things, and we're gonna to continue to try those things, we have to hold this industry accountable. We've come to the conclusion that we have to find a way to build up the movement piece of this, the political power piece of this, that's gonna hold people accountable um, and demand change. And we're gonna to have to do that with a bigger, bolder goal, which is what we learned in our battle over fracking. So there's a really big problem. 
it needs a really big solution and that is going to require us to take on these companies with power. So Christy's going to talk about um, how do we do that right here in Washington, D.C. doesn't feel like the most opportune time for big solutions to big problems <laughs> with the politics that we're dealing with. And so we're really looking very deliberately at places like different states where we can start to build this movement of people who are going to call this industry out, build that power, and be able to, to take on this, this uh, bold goal to solve a big problem. So Christy can talk about uh, some of the places where we're doing that. Great. So again, I'm Christy Kasserman. I'm Food and Water Watch's National Factory Farm Campaigner. Um, Michelle discussed this briefly, but my role is to help build support for a national ban on new and expanded factory farms to work in coalition with other groups to advocate for factory farm moratoria in key states, and to engage our membership in responding to factory farm legislation and regulatory efforts in, in several key states where we're working. And Michelle also hinted at this, but um, I am based in Eastern North Carolina. This webinar was supposed to happen a couple weeks ago, and the reason it didn't is because it was scheduled for just a few days after Hurricane Florence hit. Eastern North Carolina. And so I'll share with you briefly a little bit about my story um, over the last several weeks. I, I live on the Black River right outside of Wilmington, um, about 35 miles inland. So the hurricane made landfall very close to my home. Um, a lot of folks have heard this stat by now, but the hurricane dumped somewhere near 10 trillion gallons of rain on Eastern North Carolina, um, South Carolina, and Virginia. About 50% of that rainfall has been attributed to a warming climate. And that rainfall resulted in unprecedented flooding and devastating impacts for thousands of people in Eastern North Carolina. My own home is on nine foot stilts. It's above the 100 foot floodplain. And still we had four and a half feet of flood water in our living space. Um, and unfortunately, it wasn't just flood water. And I will share my screen. So in North Carolina, hog farms store their waste, liquid and solid, in open air lagoons. And at the height of the flooding from Hurricane Florence, nearly 100 of these hog lagoons flooded or overflowed or breached entirely, spilling all of their contents, liquids and solids, into rivers and streams. And there was a lot of media attention on the water quality impacts, but there were also really substantial human impacts. Um, this hog waste made its way into people's kitchens and their living rooms and their bedrooms, including mine. And this is a picture of the hog lagoon that breached on a tributary of the Black River upstream of my house. Um, I can tell you that at the height of the clean out, I was, I was wearing a bandana over my face because the hog smell, in addition to my mask, because the hog smell was absolutely overwhelming. It was a truly horrendous situation for my family and for thousands of other families living downstream of these operations in North Carolina. We had to get our home to eight feet. We will likely be out of it for six months to a year while we rebuild. And so there are really challenging times ahead in Eastern North Carolina right now, um, not only for the thousands of families that have been impacted by flooding and by these lagoon breaches, but also there's clearly a definite need to address the power of the factory farm industry in North Carolina. Unfortunately, as horrific as the situation is in North Carolina right now, we don't see the same political opportunity there that we see in other places. And that's because of the stranglehold that this industry has on North Carolina elected officials. Our sister organization, Food and Water Action, is working to address that. And please contact me if you'd like more information on those efforts. So we actually believe our best opportunities to begin working to get rid of factory farms are in Iowa and in Oregon. And those are the two campaigns that I'd like to talk with you a little bit about tonight. First, Iowa, where I am right now, we're advocating for a legislative moratorium on new and expanded factory farms. So just for a little bit of background, Iowa has about 15,000 factory farms. They produce about 22 billion gallons of manure every year. Iowa has 300 to 600 new factory farms every year. It has nearly 800 impaired waterways and over 200 community water systems that struggle to treat their water because of pollution from factory farms. Iowa also has no meaningful local control, meaning that city and county officials have very little authority to influence where, when, and how these facilities are built within their jurisdiction. So for those reasons and a couple others, Iowa is the right place to begin this work. 
We have a lot of strong allies in Iowa who share our theory of change. Some of them are pictured in these photos. There's a shared goal of moratorium among state, local, and national groups. We're all working in coalition together toward the same solution. And in addition to that, over 25% of counties in Iowa want stronger factory farm rules or a moratorium. So one in four counties in Iowa have passed resolutions in favor of either stronger local control or an outright moratorium on new and expanded factory farms. So there's a lot of opportunity to use that to bring political pressure in the legislature. We've just recently added new staff in Iowa. So we have an organizer on the ground here in advance of the upcoming legislative session. And we're working this week and over the following months to identify moratorium bill sponsors, to build support in key legislative districts. And our goal is to get a bill introduced and to get a committee hearing um, in one of either chamber, Senate or the House, in the coming session. And we're really excited about the opportunities in Iowa in 2019. The next slide, um, these are photos from Oregon. The other place we see a lot of potential is in Oregon where we just had a really big win. And I'm really excited to tell you all about that tonight. Um, for background, we are part of a coalition that formed several years ago to oppose a mega dairy called Lost Valley Farm. This is a 30,000 head dairy farm. It's adjacent to a 70,000 head dairy farm in an area where groundwater has already been compromised. The governor issued the permit for this facility over our objections and those of thousands of Oregonians, despite the fact that the facility had not obtained the appropriate water rights to operate. And so as a result, the company, I'm sorry, the operation began violating within a month of opening um, and continued to violate significantly for the next year. Violations like this manure spill, which you're seeing on your screen, were routine and commonplace and were happening in an ongoing fashion. During that time, we worked to keep the issue in the press. We submitted tons of right to know requests. We organized opposition and we pressured officials to act. And finally, I think this was maybe the straw that broke the camel's back, but in a right to know request, we received this photo um, from the Oregon Department of Agriculture. They had taken this photo and several others during an inspection. Um, these photos show cows standing ankle deep in a slurry of their own manure because there was not enough water on the property to clean the barn. There were also at the same time news reports that there was not enough water to provide operational restrooms for workers. So we use those photos and that news about the restrooms as an opportunity to ask our members to contact Governor Brown to demand that she shut Lost Valley down. And with our coalition partners, we generated nearly 4,000 emails to the governor. And within just a few weeks, she revoked the operating permit for this facility. It was a huge win. It was a big demonstration of like the ability that we have to influence um, elected officials to take action on this issue. The operator has unfortunately appealed and that process is underway, but the state agencies have shown no sign of walking back the permit revocation. And we have now successfully used Lost Valley Farm as an example of why these polluting mega dairies have absolutely no place in Oregon. So we're in conversation with our allies in Oregon about whether there's now an opportunity to pivot from our attention on Lost Valley Farm to a potential moratorium on mega dairies in Oregon. And we're really excited to explore political opportunities with our coalition partners in the coming session. Stay tuned for more information on that. And the final thing I'll say, um, we get this question a lot. A lot of folks think that a moratorium seems like a temporary fix, and it may be, but these campaigns are a really important step on the way to a ban. And we've learned from our campaign to ban fracking that a moratorium can buy us time without moving us away from our ultimate goal of a national ban. And so we're really excited to build power through these two campaigns in Iowa and Oregon during the coming year as we work to stop the spread of this industry. Thanks. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, so I'm going to just take a minute and talk about Food and Water Justice, the legal arm of Food and Water Watch, and um, talk about how we support the ban efforts with our litigation. Um, before I begin, we're four people strong, um, myself and my co-director, Scott Edwards. Tara Heinzen works out of our Portland, Oregon office. She does the majority of our ag litigation. And then we have an attorney in Madison, Wisconsin, Zach Corrigan, who does a lot of our water privatization work, food safety, and Scott and I also cover our um, climate and energy litigation. 
So in terms of our ag work, there's a couple of type of cases that I think can support our ban campaign. One, we, you know, would like to bring more cases that stop the proliferation of the industry. That's ideal. But in the meantime, until we transition out of the ban, as we discussed, there are thousands and thousands of existing facilities that should be held accountable. And so we try to also vigorously enforce environmental laws because the industry now knows it kind of pays off not to or to pollute rather than comply with the law because the cops aren't on the beat. EPA and the states have long walked away from regulation and enforcement in place of voluntary measures just as have never worked. Um, so I'm gonna give you a couple examples um, of each. So in the first category of fighting the prolifer proliferation of CAFOs, we um, not too long ago filed a case in Maryland. I live in the Chesapeake Bay watershed in Maryland and so do 300 million chickens on the Eastern shore. They produce 550,000 tons of waste every year, about half of that is excess, meaning there's no land to apply it to as fertilizer. And we've seen tremendous growth in the size of the complexes that house these poultry, uh, the broilers, and also the density. And so we decided to look at where the finances are coming to, you know, where's the financial support to, for the explosion of these um, poultry operations. And so we've decided to sue the Farm Services Administration, which is an agency that provides loans to um, facilities that or people who want to construct uh, poultry CAFOs in Maryland. And um, we, uh, under federal law, when you get loans, you have to look at the environmental consequences of that loan. Unfortunately, FSA looks at the loans individually and it doesn't look at the cumulative impacts of all of the operations they've supported. And we think that that's illegal. And so last month we survived a motion to dismiss by FSA. And so hopefully we'll be proceeding to the merits of the case. And we think that if we win this um, particular case, it could have real consequences for how they're looking at the development of this industry in Maryland. Hopefully it will uh, result in fewer planned capos receiving loans on the Eastern shore. And we'd like to expand our um, research on how to go after uh, financial support for capos. Because for example, FSA just in Maryland between um, 2009 and 2015 issued approximately $64 million worth of ownership and operating loans to capos. 47 million of that went to these poultry operations. We've also worked with local um, communities where we can to pass ordinances that effectively have acted like bans. And where we can, we try to stop things like slaughterhouses or miniature energy facilities, because if we stop some of that infrastructure, it stops the hundreds of capos coming in behind those facilities that provide the feedstock. So the second type of case that we file um, is focused on accountability and the enforcement of existing laws. We um, have recently been focused on the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, which is a federal environmental law that's only been applied a couple times to the ag industry, and it can be used very effectively by citizens to protect their drinking water. And so I'm going to show you a picture of Mount Air. So this is a slaughterhouse facility in um, Millsboro, Delaware, that processes 2 million chickens per week and um, produces 2.4 million gallons of waste per day. You can see in the back there, it sits on the Indian River, and in the upper right hand is one of the many impoundments that they have. The largest one holds 14.2 million gallons of wastewater. And this operation then takes its wastewater, and as we've talked about with other facilities, oops, wrong direction, um, applies it to cropland. Um, groundwater monitoring wells have consistently exceeded the drinking water standard for nitrate, and both EPA and the state have taken legal actions, but none of those actions have remedied the problem. Um, based on our research, they've been spraying wastewater that's up to 41 times the legal limit for nitrates, 5,500 times the limit for fecal, and this can have real serious um, health consequences for residents. And so here's a picture. It, the facility looks so much closer when you're physically there, but this was taken from a home that's um, located across the street from Mount Air. They spray up into that row of trees. And you can see in the foreground a little bit to the right, that's a drinking water well pump. So you can see they're spraying really, really close to sources of drinking water for, for people. And as a result, um, we have some significant impacts so this is Gina Burton. She's a resident of Millsboro. She lives near the facility. She's a plaintiff of uh, a member of Food and Water Watch and a plaintiff in the case. She uh, 
has lost a son to asthma who worked at the plant. She has herself gastric problems, respiratory problems, all of her hair has fallen out. Her daughter was born with birth defects, including an extra ear that she had to have removed at the age of eight. Other families that live across the street from that facility from Mount Air are, have suffered, um, people have suffered seizures, miscarriages, and health impacts like miscarriages, like birth defects are very consistent with nitrate contamination of drinking water. So in March of 20, in March 28th of this year, we filed a notice of intent to sue Mount Air. The state stepped in to take an action, which, is, which we've all also moved to intervene in. So it's really in these procedural um, stages. I also wanted to mention that before we filed, we were very concerned that the notice would elicit a legislative response because a lot of times legal wins will be undone by um, bad legislation. And so Patty, myself, and others have been on Capitol Hill educating legislators about the importance of statutes like RICRA. Um, and, and currently there's a pending bill that was introduced by Dan Newhouse, who's a Congress member from Washington State in response to the first ever lawsuit brought on behalf of a rural community against a cluster of dairy capos, a kind of a similar story to the folks in Delaware where their water had been contaminated for over 15 years, EPA had taken action in the state, nothing was remedied. Um, and in response to uh, using their rights under RICRA to protect themselves, we had this bad piece of legislation. So we spent a lot of time um, educating um, folks, including uh, Delaware's two Democratic senators, Sen Senator Coons and Senator Carper, in part because Mount Air's in, in Delaware, but also uh, Senator Carper sits on a, a key Senate environmental committee and is in a position to really fight bad legislation. And so far, um, with the community's help and our organizers help, we have we have them in the right place. We need to continue to keep the pressure on, but it's something that I really appreciate about working at Food and Water Watch, the fact that we have or organizing support and um, lobbying support to help protect any wins. Um, finally, I'll just mention quickly, um, Chrissy talked about the Iowa campaign and the Oregon campaign, and Tara has also been um, uh, taking parallel legal actions as a tactic in those campaigns. For example, in Iowa, she filed a petition with the state to increase local counties' um, control and ability to make decisions about keeping CAFOs out of those counties. We knew that the petition was gonna be denied, but it was a really good organizing tool and we worked with counties who agreed that if the petition was in fact wasn't, was denied, which it was, that they would help us go to the legislature and um, ask for uh, moratoria, local control or both. And so there's over 20 counties that are working with us at least um, to do that. And so again, our litigation is an important tactic in broader campaigns, which I think makes it more effective. It certainly makes it more fun and allows us more creativity as lawyers. And so um, it's been uh, great to work at Food and Water Watch for those reasons. Um, I think we're kicking it back okay. to you, Patty, for a little bit of a wrap sure. up before we get to the Q&A session. Sure. So I think um, kind of just to pull all that together, it's a lot of stuff, right? Which is welcome to the world of working on factory farms. It has a lot of tentacles as an issue. There's a lot of layers. But I think to kind of pull it all together and to wrap up is probably a good opportunity to talk about a report that we did that we released earlier this spring with the original title of the urgent case for a ban on factory farms. We just put it all in here. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we outlined, we have all of these environmental impacts, public health impacts, you know, on and on and on the problems. There's a strong case. We can't regulate these enough is enough. We need to stop the proliferation. We need to stop building factory farms and stop expanding the ones that we have. So this kind of makes that case. And then it says, we, need, we know we have a bunch of things to do to get there. So we need to stop building new ones. We need to have no more expansion of the existing factory farms. The ones that are here, we need to hold them accountable, right? They have to follow environmental rules. And the companies that often, the companies own the animals on these farms, they need to be accountable for those things. And then we need to have a smart plan that involves public policy to transition a lot of the folks in many parts of agriculture, whether they're raising the corn and soybeans that are fed to these animals or whether they're running these factory farms, we need a plan to transition them to something else. And there's ways to use federal research money, farm bill programs, and even public spending 
to, to make that transition and to rebuild the infrastructure we need for a food system that doesn't have factory farms in it. We can figure those policies out, but as we're doing that and we've outlined those things that we need to do in this piece, this organizing that we've heard about in Oregon, in Iowa, in all of these places is how we're gonna build the people power and the um, to be able to make our elected officials make these policy changes. So bad policy got us into this mess and we're gonna have to make good policy to get out and that happens when we have enough people involved that we can make policymakers do the right thing. So I think that's that's kind of where we can leave it. This is a big campaign with a big goal. Um, but one of the first things that we have to do is to put out the idea out there that we don't have to have these things. They're not inevitable. Um, and we need to say enough is enough and then that it's time for a ban and to make the space for people to actually imagine that we could do this and to get people, to attract people with that bold goal so that we build enough power that we can go, go get it done. So I think that's well said. Where we are, right? Yeah. So right now it's time for the Q&A session. So if you haven't had a chance to ask a question but would like to, again, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A button. And if you press on that button, it'll allow you to type in your question. So feel free to take a minute to do that now if you haven't already. All right, some questions are coming in. Thank you. Um, so here's one of the first questions. Should we be also focused on telling people to vote with their dollars and boycott factory farm meat or go vegan? Patty, do you want to take that the, the consumer sure, angle? Sure, we get this a lot. Not that. Um, and there's, you know, this is this is a pretty common response that people have, right? That this is a product, this, these are problems that come from a product that I buy is my role to shop differently. And there's always improvements people can make. So we have stuff on our website about what do different labels mean? You know, what can I, what, is, what does it mean? Is it really different if it's organic? So there's things we can all do to make those choices, you know, more informed uh, and to do the best job we can in that transaction. But we're not gonna get out of this problem entirely by shopping. Um, like I was saying, we have a policy system that makes it really hard to buy something different because uh, our system is now dominated by these choices. Um, and we think that there's a, a way that we can raise animals better uh, as opposed to saying you can't have these, you can't have animals in the food system at all. So we think that we can do the best we can in the transaction you're faced with. You can arm yourself with information. You can go look for better options. But in addition to that, you're not done after you make a better choice or you go to the farmer's market or you do, you do what you do to avoid these products. We need to go change the rules and change the system uh, because we're not going to be able to just simply shop our way to an alternative. We have to change the rules that let these big companies create this bad system in the first place. They're not going to give it back without a fight. And that fight isn't necessarily going to happen at the grocery store. Thanks. Okay, the next question. Um, Chrissy, you mentioned that North Carolina doesn't present the best opportunity for similar campaigns like you're running in Iowa, Oregon. Can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. So North Carolina has a factory farm problem, but North Carolina also has a political problem. It's a very challenging political landscape. The industry has a stranglehold on the legislature. And that is something that we're involved in addressing through Food and Water Action, and we've got information online about that, and I'm happy to share a little bit more about those efforts if folks are interested in contacting me. But our analysis is that the place to begin this campaign, these moratorium campaigns to build toward a ban, is in Iowa and in um, Oregon. We, we have lots of momentum behind a shared strategy in those places, and so, you know, everybody's on board with the same set of tactics and with the same ultimate goal. And we have allies in those places that share our theory of change. So we, we um, are involved in addressing um, issues in North Carolina through Food and Water Action, but right now we're not running a state-based campaign there um, with regard to a moratorium or anything like we're doing in Iowa and Oregon. Okay, next question is again for you, Patty, because oh. you're the food safety expert. Okay. So is it fair to say that food sprayed with waste is not edible? Um, it's a good question. So when we're talking about factory farms, 
you know, dealing with their manure, the term they use is they land apply the manure and they get out of an awful lot of things that should happen in terms of like being smart about how much you apply by saying, oh, this is fertilizer and we need this fertilizer to grow crops. In many, 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 many circumstances, the crops they're growing aren't necessarily going to be eaten by humans, right? They're growing soybeans and they're growing corn which is not corn on the cob for us. It's corn for ethanol or it's corn for animal feed. So um, that's where a lot of this animal waste is going. Um, we do have some food safety rules. They, they should not be using this to grow you know, vegetables that we're eating or lettuce or something like that. There are some rules about that. So there's, there's that immediate food safety piece, but then we have to have a bigger conversation about this is over applied. There's too much manure. It's applied to too little ground because they're trying to dispose it. It's, it's dispose of it. It's not really about fertilizer. And we know it ends up in water. It makes its way to groundwater. It makes its way to a stream or a river. And what happens to that water then? It becomes somebody's drinking water downstream. And maybe it gets used to irrigate crops later on. So it may not be direct that it was put directly on the food that you're eating, but it could end up in the food system later. And we have seen problems. You know, there was a recall of, um, there was actually a recall of lettuce this summer for E. coli from Arizona. And it seems like we're slowly piecing together the mystery of what contaminated that lettuce, that it was grown with irrigation water. The irrigation water had E. coli and they think the E. coli came from a giant cattle factory farm, you know, down the road. So it may not be directly applied to the food, but it's out there and we do have to worry about it. And so we can have that conversation about what are the rules for how far away to grow the lettuce from the factory farm? Or we could say, why do we have this factory farm, right? It is creating risk. It is creating too much risk simply by having that many animals together. So we need to kind of flip the conversation and talk about why do we have these factory farms that can inject this risk into our food supply. Okay, thanks. Okay, next question. Um, isn't there, te aren't there technologies that can capture greenhouse gases at factory farms and create renewable energy? So this is a hot topic right now, especially among the industry. They talk about things like anaerobic digesters as like a win-win, right? They capture methane, you can burn it for energy, and you're taking away, uh, um, care of your excess waste problem. Um, we think that they are false solutions for a number of reasons. Um, First, they don't eliminate a lot of the main pollutants of concern, nutrients like nitrogen, like phosphorus. It, it remains in the digestate or the byproduct. And in fact, through the digestion process, um, pollutants like phosphorus become more water available, meaning once you, you have to get rid of it, and a lot of times it's you know, marketed as fertilizer, if you put that on the ground, it's actually, you know, you're risking, it's, you're now, um, waterways are more at risk of, of pollution. Um, we also don't think they work very well. So based on our research, that some don't work well at all. Others will reduce some methane, but they'll increase other types of greenhouse gases like um, nitrogen oxide, um, carbon dioxide. And so on balance, you're not necessarily producing greenhouse gases. They're incredibly expensive. They can be over a million dollars a piece for these um, operations. So they're often taxpayer funded, right? So we're paying for industries R&D to experiment with these things. Meanwhile, you're entrenching the system further, you're trapping farmers into more debt. Um, and a lot of them, you know, are, are being shuttered because uh, I think as of 2016, half of them were shuttered in California where we see a lot of these digesters at large scale dairies. Um, they're, because they're expensive, because it's complicated technology, because the feedstock's not consistent, so we'd rather spend those millions of dollars that are propping up this failed system, um, we'd rather those, that money be spent on transitioning farmers out of the factory farm system so you can start to um, have a food system that's good for communities, good for the environment where farmers can make a living wage. All right, let's see. All right, Chrissy. What keeps you motivated and so positive, especially because you've been personally impacted um, by the factory farm system and, and you live in one of these impacted communities? That's a good question. Um, I think a couple things. I have a, I have a deep love for rural places. I've never lived somewhere that wasn't rural. Um, and, you know, I grew up in somewhere rural and my whole adult life has been organizing in rural places. And so I care deeply about the issues that are facing rural communities. Um, I also have a really strong sense of justice. My mother would tell you that my 
some of my first words were, that's not fair. Um, and so I was motivated by that. Um, but I also think, especially in, in the recent weeks, that I'm pretty motivated by a healthy sense of outrage. Um, and, you know, the fact that um, this, you know, this industry directly impacts the lives of thousands of people across this country. And um, that just isn't fair. And so I think that is what's keeping me going over the last few weeks, especially. Thanks, Chrissy. I think that's a common trait among human mm -hmm. water watchers, right? A healthy sense of outrage. Um, so um, we're running out of time. Thank you everyone for the terrific questions. We wanna be respectful um, because it's late in the evening. So it's time to wrap up. I wanna thank Patty here in DC and, and Chrissy in Iowa for joining us and for their great presentations. I also wanna thank Jennifer Kalarsik who is behind the scenes <laughs> on our development team putting all these webinars together. It takes a lot of work. Um, this is the last webinar of our series this year. Our next series will start next March, so we'll be sure to get back in touch with you early in the year to, um, so you know what to expect. Uh, we'd like to hear your feedback and thoughts, so please reach out. You can email us at champion at foodfwwatch.org, right? So that's C-H-A-M-P-I-O-N at F-W-W-A-T-C-H dot O-R-G, champion at fwwatch.org. So we'll be sure to get back to you. Uh, thanks again for joining us this evening and also thank you again so much for your contributions and support of Food and Water Watch. I hope you have a great rest of your evening.